Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Ursula. I am a Firefox developer at Mozilla, so I do all kinds of Firefox-related stuff. And today I want to talk to you about um, how to write a modern web app uh, in a legacy code base, which is a problem that is becoming more and more popular, and it's something that my team specifically has been working on. And uh, I just wanted to talk to you about some of the challenges that developers go through uh, when doing this. So, I want to open up with this, and this is a screenshot of something called Bugzilla, um, and it's how we track all of our bugs um, at Mozilla. And I want to draw your attention specifically to these two areas here. Um, so you can see this is a very old bug, 20 years old. This was before it was called Firefox, right? We called it Mozilla Classic back then. Um, and it ju it's just to give you an idea that like, this is sort of the state of how old the code base really is, right? And maybe Mozilla.c no longer exists, but a lot of the things, um, a lot of the code is still around from, from a long time ago, right? This is a screenshot of um, a tool that we use to search through our code base. And what I, I just did a really simple search for files ending in Zool. Uh, if you don't know what Zool is, I don't blame you. It's an XML-based language that Mozilla invented to do a lot of our front-end uh, stuff. So a lot of our front-end UI code is written in Zool. And so after, you know, it's 2018 now, and still 153 of our files are still being written in Zool, right? So it's not like HTML, it's, it's kind of a mess. So it's old, basically. So this is what I'm working on. This is called Activity Stream, um, and it's whenever you open a new tab page, all the pretty little boxes that you see, this is what I'm working on. And this is written with all the fancy new kind of millennial tech React, and it's using Webpack and Babel and all that, all that stuff. And so what we wanted to do is we kind of wanted to like shove this into the Firefox code base and have it be available to everybody. But of course, that was not as simple as we thought it would be. So to give you a, sort of a side-by-side -side comparison to contrast how big of a difference this is, we have the Firefox code base, which is a bunch of C++ and JSMs, and it's glued together with these IDLs. We have a mixture of Zool and HTML and CSS for our front end. Uh, all of our version control is done in Mercurial. Um, and we use Bugzilla, and we have an eight-week release cycle. And what we wanted to write was a fancy new web app that used all the new ES6 syntax, CommonJS. We wanted to use React and Redux and SCSS. We have uh, NPM, we have Babel, we have Webpack. And we wanted to write it, or we wanted to use Git and GitHub for all of our issue tracking. And we have two week milestones. So every two weeks, we're ready to ship something new, which obviously conflicts with the eight week release cycle. So, what's the point here? The point is that Firefox is old and that the web moves really fast. And if you want to stay modern and relevant on the web, you have to update your technology to reflect that. So this is going to sort of talk about uh, three different categories that, that I, I thought about when making this. The first one is all the technical and testing challenges that we went through. So before I get too technical, a little bit about uh, how the Firefox code actually works, right? So Firefox runs in a sandbox. Uh, which means that there's two processes, right? There's two different contexts that you can run your code in. There's the main process, also known as the parent process, and this um, is all of the browser code, like all of the heavy lifting that Firefox needs to do. And it can do privileged actions, so it can access your file system, it can modify your preferences, um, and it ha has access to all those security things. And then there's the content process, also known as the child process. And this is where the actual content of the web actually renders. Uh, and this cannot do privileged actions. So it can't modify uh, your file system or, or your preferences and all that stuff. So code that runs in one context does not run in the other context. That means that there is a lot of code separation within the repository itself. And that, that's something that we had to deal with. Shared code was the first challenge that we really encountered. So Firefox has a lot of ways to import modules within each context itself, right? But what we wanted to do is have this sort of shared state of the new tab page. And that means that we had to have the same modules running in both contexts. So what do you do? Um, because there is no way to import the same module in two different contexts. So you can copy the code, you can copy paste into a different module. Uh, you can write a new module loader, which a lot of people have done in the past. Uh, we took a slightly different approach, which seems a little convoluted, but it, this is what ha we had to do. 
So we used Babel, and we wrote a bunch of our JSMs, and then we used Babel to convert those JSMs to common JS, and then we used Webpack so that we can import them in both contexts. Um, and this was something that nowhere in the repository of Firefox uh, was really doing. So this was something that we had to, that we had to you know, forefront. So what to keep in mind here is that you have to sort of be ready for a mix of architectural patterns, right? Like the code that you're writing is not necessarily going to fit perfectly and uniformly in the code that you're trying to shove it into. So you have to be ready for those kinds of challenges. Another thing that we came across was multi-process JavaScript, which a lot of um, isolated web apps don't really have to deal with a lot. But we had to architect an app that was using async message passing, a common store between the two processes so that all of our state was in sync and you can open 50 tabs and they'll all show the, the same thing. Um, but Firefox has already a built-in message manager, right? So that we can communicate through process boundaries. We call that IPC. Um, and you just basically send messages between the content process and the main process uh, to share information that way. But what we wanted to do was slightly different, right? Because we wanted to dispatch actions using Redux within our own sort of app itself. But it had to communicate with the Firefox message manager as well. So we have our own action dispatcher, and we had to attach that to the Firefox message manager. And I'll show a diagram so that it's a little clearer. But basically what we had to do is we had to wrap a bunch of existing code in new code so that we could make it work. So this is a diagram of what it sort of looked like. So at the bottom, we have all of our Re React stuff, and that's running in the, uh, in the child process, and that's where all of our UI is. And then we have a Redux store that kind of sits on top, also living in the child process, and this is really typical of uh, web apps, and that's sort of where it ends, right? But that's not where it ends here, because we need a copy of that Redux store that lives in the main process so that we can sync our data between modules, right? So we have this Firefox message manager, that sits at the process boundary. So our action Redux, uh, sorry, a Redux store in the child process can dispatch and receive actions from the Firefox message manager, which can dispatch and receive actions from the store in the parent process, which can dispatch and receive actions to the Firefox message manager, right? So we have this action dispatcher that's sort of wrapped around the Firefox message manager, which makes it much more complicated now because we have actions that we can dispatch within our app, but also actions that we can dispatch within process boundaries, but it's sort of like behind the scenes using the message manager. So this was something that was really um, sort of complicated to figure out and make sure that it was working really well. The next thing that we ran into, which we didn't think was going to be a huge problem at first, but ended up being a huge problem in the end, was testing <laughs> frameworks, right? Uh, we wanted to use Karma as the test runner and Mocha for the framework and Chai and you know, sign on and all that fun new stuff. Um, but obviously that does not exist in Firefox, right? They use a really old test framework called Moki Tests for sort of browser tests, like I clicked on this and this context menu showed up, right? Um, and Moki Tests are very old, very difficult to use and write, very difficult to debug, and we just, we were not about it. We didn't want to do it. We wanted to use our, our fancy new stuff but the tree was not ready. Um, and we quickly learned that writing tests internally actually wasn't enough. And we spent a lot of time actually fixing the existing tests in Firefox. So as soon as we dropped our code into Firefox and we ran the test suite, everything all over the place was failing. And so it wasn't enough to just get our test passing, but a lot of the integration tests in Firefox were just not happy with what we were doing. And the lesson here is that you <laughs> we spent a lot more time than expected fixing tests, right? So leave plenty of time to fix old legacy tests that you were hoping you would never have to look at, but it turns out that you actually do. Uh, another thing that sort of came about in testing was that we had to mock a bunch of our modules, which we didn't think of, right? So we know unit tests are very important for your application, right? Uh, we, you can have them internally and isolated in, in the system, and it's really great. But there's a lot of external dependencies in the legacy code base that affect those unit tests, right? So we import some module that exists somewhere in the Firefox code base, and then when we run our tests, our unit tests, it fails because it can't find that module because, oops, we're in the content process, and that module can only be loaded in the main process, right? So we had to end up actually mocking out a bunch of external APIs that actually wouldn't be available in the context of our unit tests, which we didn't really think about. 
So what we had to do is, is write this utility that allows you to override properties on the global object. So you would import something, we would inject into it, override it, make it some you know, mocked object, and then we would use that in our testing framework, right? So those were like some of the big uh, technical challenges that, that we were experiencing when we tried to just land it in, uh, in Firefox. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the source control and issue tracking stuff. Like I mentioned they use Bugzilla and Mercurial, and we were all about the Git stuff. Um, and so there were some conflicts there. So we wanted to use Git because obviously it's modern and it's easy, and Mercurial is kind of hard to grapple with, um, and you need special review privileges if you want to do in reviews in Firefox, right? Not everybody can just review a patch and then land it in Firefox, right? There's obviously things that you have to do there. Um, but you can't use Git in Firefox's code base, right? You can use this thing called Git Cinnabar, which is really just Mercurial, but lets you use Git commands, but we didn't, we didn't want, really want to you know, do all of that. So here's what we had to do. We had our GitHub repo that lives outside of the tree. Um, and this is what we did periodically. So we would land pull requests in our, Git, in our GitHub repo and do reviews internally on our team in Git. Um, so we would write our Git patch in our repo. Everything's great. We land it. We review it. Great. Then periodically, once a week, twice a week, we would uh, use a node script to copy over all the files in our repo into the Firefox repo. Then we would have this huge diff of all the changes that have happened in the last week, basically, in our repo that we are trying to land in Firefox. And then we would go into uh, Mercurial, and we would turn that into a Mercurial patch. Um, and then we would be able to push to Firefox. And some one person would have to review like 10K lines of code um, and just be like, yeah, this works for me, and, la and lands it, you know? <laughs> um, so this uh, this like. Uh, it quickly became very annoying, right? Because a lot of the times things will land in Firefox and we have to backport those changes into our GitHub repo. And it sort of is just becoming this huge mess of things that we have, you know, two different states of, of Firefox that we need to deal with and it's, it's awful. Um, along those same lines, we wanted to use GitHub instead of Bugzilla, right? Because GitHub is modern, and it's widely adapted, and it's easy to use, um, and it's easy to file tickets, right? It's easy for reviews. It's great for collaboration. It's, it's wonderful. But obviously, Firefox and Mozilla uses Bugzilla to track all of its bugs, right? And so what we had to end up doing was we had to go through the bugs that people file on Bugzilla, like employees and contributors that are more u that know that the, if there's an issue with Firefox, they go to Bugzilla, and they file it on, on, on Bugzilla. And then during our triage, we, uh, triage meeting, we would have to go into those, get them all, and mirror them to GitHub, and then triage them, which you know, adds an extra step to our triage, makes our meetings longer, and we have to remember that this is something that we have to do. So that's annoying. Um, so what's important to, for, to not forget here is that people are comfortable filing issues a certain way, right? So you can't just, we could have just been like, whatever, people who file them on Bugzilla, like they'll, it won't get fixed for 20 years and then they'll come back and file it on GitHub and we'll fix it there, right? But we can't, we can't have that kind of attitude, right? Because we can't expect all of the, uh, the Mozilla employees who have issues to just all of a sudden change everything that they know and start using GitHub because that's what, that's what we wanted to do, right? So there was a lot of compromise there. And it takes longer for us, but that's what we needed to do. So the last aspect that I wanted to talk about, which a lot of developers don't really think about because you're sort of just working, you know, you're landing patches and you're, it's, it, you always think it's your manager's job to deal with this, but it's the human and the cultural aspect to this, which was, which was pretty big for us too. The first thing that we had to deal with was uh, trying to land bundles in the tree, right? Nobody wants to land a bundle of all of our content code, all of our like, front end code in the tree. Uh, but we needed React in Redux to exist in the tree, right? Like, it wasn't there. Nobody was using React in Firefox, so we needed those files there. And we wanted to just kind of bundle it up and land it, and we went to the engineers with that, and they said, absolutely not. You're not landing bundles in the tree. So we had to have a lot of back and forth with, with the engineers to be like, well, what can we land? Like, what would you be comfortable landing in the tree? So we had to commit the actual files of... Um, of React and Redux into the tree, which is not ideal, uh, but it's a compromise, including all the licensing and all, you know, every time we just upgraded to React 16, and that was like a big thing. Um, but that's something that we, had to, that we had to do if we wanted those files in the tree. Uh, 
Firefox uses a lot of JSMs, um, and that means that we had to write a lot of JSMs so that we could fit with the Firefox code style, which is something that we didn't really want to do. Right? We wanted our app to be super modular, you know, really like small independent modules that don't really know about each other, and we can import 20 different modules, and everything's really sort of microservice-y kind of thing. Uh, but Firefox gives a lot of overhead to loading modules, so we had to compromise. You know, we went with to these engineers with these these patches, and it had 20 different module load, modules being loaded, and they were like, "No, you will have one module, and all of your code will live there, and you'll import it once because it's a lot of overhead to just import 20 different modules, right?" So that was something that we had to think over, right? Like, OK, well, now we have to think about, do we really want these modules to be separated, or can we shove them into one giant JSM? And how does that affect our tests? And how does that affect our performance and all of that? So there was a lot of compromise, a lot of back and forth there. The release schedule was a really big issue, because Firefox takes eight weeks to ship an update, which you know, in production code is, is fine, but we have two-week milestones. And so every two weeks, we're ready to ship something new. Um, and our designers have given us new specs, and, we, and there's new bugs, and we're ready every two weeks that we want to we wanna ship something. Uh, we have lots of A-B tests. You know, we have a lot of style updates. We have bug fixes. We have feature updates, all that stuff every two weeks. Um, but of course, we can't update all of Firefox every two weeks, because that would be ridiculous. Um, so we can't afford to eight we wait eight weeks. So what do we do? Well, our compromise was that we had to actually ship our, um, our code as a system add-on to the browser and get a different release cycle. So if you ship as a system add-on, you ship with the browser by default, but you get sort of this like go faster, update sooner, out of band cycle thing. Um, so you can, you can push updates directly to the add-on. Um, but this introduced a whole bunch of new challenges that we weren't really expecting because now we had to bootstrap ourselves into the browser on startup. There was a whole bunch of you know, timing issues and performance issues with being an add-on that we hadn't really thought of before. But we really wanted to ship every two weeks, right? So this is something that, that we had to compromise on. Well, one of the things that we started to find was very important was that communication was really, really, really key here. Lots of developers are really set in their ways about the Firefox code. You know, they've been working there for 10 years. They, they're old school. They, they really like the old Firefox code. And they're not about to just land a bunch of React and, you know, stuff and karma in the tree. Um, so we had to change our strategy a lot, right? We had to be a lot less isolated. We thought we could just develop this thing on our own, land it, and everyone would be happy. But we had to be much less isolated. Um, we had to write a lot more code that integrates with the existing code, so a lot of things that were just not written within our app alone, but that were landing directly in the tree. We had to join a bunch of the Firefox meetings, talk to a lot of the, uh, the engineers so that they know what's coming. And, they know, and, and one of the things that was really important was we had to know who to talk to about this legacy code. Like, we're trying to modify this module that was written seven years ago and never touched, and like, who do we talk to about that? Well, like, what's the last name on the, uh, on the commit message? Something like that, you know? So, so we had to know who to talk to, and we had to really be back and forth a lot. Lots of conversations about data collection, you know? Like, Firefox, we know, doesn't collect any of your data. But on the new tab page, there's a lot of things to interact with. And we want to know what's working, and we want to know what you're clicking on and what you hate. Um, but that was, like, sort of a, you know, a touchy subject with, with Firefox, and so there was a lot of conversations about what are we allowed to collect? How do we collect it? How do we do this you know, in a privacy-protecting way? So a lot of conversations about that, too. So some takeaways. Um, something to always make sure of is to know when to make the right compromises, right? So we really wanted to use uh, Git, and we didn't want to convert to Mercurial, so we have to use that you know, silly little way of doing things, which is annoying. But that's something, some sacrifice that we decided to make because we really wanted to continue to use Git. But there were other things, like being super modular, that we didn't really care too much about, so, it was so we can compromise on those. Another thing is to be open about the changes that the product is making to the legacy code base. Um, we wouldn't have been able to land it if it wasn't for the conversations with the really senior engineers that were really helping a lot with this. Um, we, we couldn't have just gone to them and been like, we are landing this no matter what you say, because that would obviously not have gone very well. So we had to really be open about all of the different changes that this is going to have on the code base. And finally, don't be afraid to introduce new tech uh, and to modernize the old code. You know, like it, you need to be able to maintain the code over many years, and it's going to change a lot. And the web changes really quickly, 
so you have to modernize your tech um, eventually, right? So don't be afraid. I know it's not, it might sound like you're going to have all these problems trying to integrate into your legacy code base, but don't be afraid to do it. It needs to be done. You need to keep your code base modern. So that's all I have for you guys. Thank you.